Brothers, let's rise and lift our voice in praise. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength. All of my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you. is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, it's in you. Would you please welcome those around you this morning? Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. Hello everyone, welcome to a West Main Church of Christ. I'm here to tell you about these couple cards. The first one is the welcome card. You could fill it out if you were a member or a guest and we could tell that you were here. And then we have the prayer concern card. You could put your concern on it, and we'll, we will pray, pray for you throughout the week. And then you could check this for elders only box if you want it to be private. And then lastly, we have the kid stuff card where you could put your notes or doodle on it. Thank you, and hope you have a good worship. These guys are like professionals, aren't they? Wow. 
Excellent job. Hey, uh, we have some new information coming up for Wednesday classes. This week is our last uh, episode in The Chosen. And then uh, after this Wednesday, we'll take a week off for spring vacation. There's a great cheer for that. Yeah, yeah. Only the teachers and kids said that. And then after spring break on April 5th will be our next Wednesday night. You're going to have two choices for classes uh, for the spring season. And you have a choice of attending Dan Beek's class, Growing in the Promises, 6.30 here in the auditorium. Or you can choose to meet in the fireside room. And we're going to be having a parenting class uh, with positive discipline. And that's going to have to be led by me. And that's going to also be at 6.30. So those are your choices. Uh, that'll be for seven weeks uh, this spring season. I hope you'll make a choice to join us for one of those Wednesday classes. Again, we're still looking for folks to sign up for coffee and snacks. Uh, the list is right by the coffee maker. So please check that out. And uh, don't forget Women's Retreat coming up April 21 through the 23rd. Uh, there'll be more information about how to register for that very soon. Quest begins uh, Sunday mornings on April 2nd. So just a couple of weeks away, be looking forward to joining in with Quest. If you have questions about that, see Charlie. And lastly, I uh, wanted you to know that Mandy, our dear sister Mandy, has been moved to a private room at Asante Hospital. Uh, she would love for you to come visit. Her room number is 5357, and she's waiting there for a rehab place for her to recover even further. So we're thankful to hear about her progress. Let's stand as we join in scripture together and as we worship. Would you please participate in the portion that's underlined from the book of Ephesians? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as children through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty word.
His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord of hosts. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us all exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us all exalt his holy name. I sought the Lord, I heard as he answered, and he delivered me from my fears. Those who behold him will shine with a radiance, for in his presence terror is gone. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us all exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us all exalt his holy name. Good morning, church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you today uh, in this holy place, Lord. Uh, we uh, thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, uh, the safety to return to here, um, to be with one another again, Lord. Uh, thank you for the, the snow and the rain and the sunshine that we've had this last week. Um, we do need more rain even though it feels sometimes like we're drowning, but the rain is good, Lord. Um, bless us as we uh, continue through with worship. Be with Andrew as he uh, is uh, leading the, the lesson today, Lord. Uh, just speak through him. Uh, be with us as we go through this next week, Lord, and just uh, guide our way. And in your son's name, amen. And David said these words, recorded in 2 Samuel. <clears throat> the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. You, O oh Lord, are my refuge. You are holy and just. You are faithful and righteous. You, O oh Lord, are my refuge. By your mercy you cover me under the shadow.
to bring the communion meditation this morning and this thought that I'd just go with the scripture and read a few verses to help us to get our minds right before we partake in uh, the Lord's command um, if you'd like to turn with me or you could just listen along it's Luke 22 verse 17 through 20 I'll have a couple scriptures just to reflect and this is um, the disciples as they sit around the table. It says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, 
I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. If you'd like to turn with me also into Luke 24, a few days after um, Calvary, this is out of Luke as well, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and a certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when you were, uh, spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, "The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men, and be crucified, and in the third day rise again." And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them. They told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose, and he ran to the tomb. And he stooped down, and he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. These verses bring forth what we're here today to do, which is the Lord's command. Jesus broke bread with the disciples, and he took the fruit of the vine, which we're getting ready to do. And most importantly... Three days later, he rose from the grave. Without that, all that would have been for naught. Um, before we pray, just wanted to remind you, you have emblems in the front here, also in the back. Um, after we're done praying, we can get up and there'll be probably music playing and take part in the communion. We can take it together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to join together as the disciples did with your son. And remember that great sacrifice, that sacrifice that, as the word says, it, it brought us into the new covenant. Your son would shed his body, a, a lamb with no blemish, for those who had sinned, for the, the sinful. He would give up himself to the sinners and give up his life as a great sacrifice. And his body would be there on the cross. He would shed his blood that would wash us clean and take away our transgressions and lead us back to you. As we remember those things, let us uh, take of this fruit of vine and this bread and do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Come to the table and worship the Savior. Taste what forgiveness is for. His mercy will lead us, the grace of God feed us, making us hungry for more. His body was given for you and for me. Look on the cross and believe. The bread has been broken. Our eyes have been opened. Believe
without touching the scars. His death reconciled us. We live sanctified to become what we already are. To Him who loves us and freed us to love, be glory, honor, and praise. The bread has been broken. Good morning. Um, my daughter sent us a text this morning. It's super good. I can't show you the picture, but it's a, it's a picture of a little cracker. Right? It says, this is the body of Christ. It's like, oh, that's the text I want to get. Like every day, right? And it just reminded me, I mean, yeah, I love my daughter, she's super sweet. Um, but it also reminded me that, that that's what we're doing, right? It's not just in this room. It is the body of Christ for the body of Christ. So we are not just us here this morning. Um, and then one other thing before I read the, the prayer concern, this is this is uh, our memory verse from our class this morning. You notice I said memory verse and yet I'm gonna read it. <laughs> it's kind of long. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. They shall be his people and God himself will be among them. That's what we get to look forward to, is God with us, us with each other, and not having anything else to worry about, but God is here with us. Josh Johnson wrote a prayer request this morning. My grandfather, Larry Den, is still in the hospital with acute spinal stenosis. The pain he has been experiencing is near unbearable. Prayers for healing, comfort, and pain resolution as he is struggling. So would you pray with me this morning? Father God, as we come to you this morning, we are so grateful that you hear us, that you've called us, and that you are our Father. And when we look at the circumstances around us and some of the decisions we've made and we just look back on our life, we realize um, how amazing that is that you would have chosen us and called us and and given us value and worth and a hope and something to look forward to and so god i just i pray that as we go through our life 
that as we go through our week, that we are seeking your kingdom, that we're living, um, God, that we're living as your children and your kingdom and that we're bringing that here to the people around us, that we are, our eyes are always focused on you and that we are choosing you above our current circumstances. I just pray that, um, that you will choose to reveal yourself to us and that we will be looking for you, we will be listening for you and that we'll be obedient. And God, just as we think of you and the hope that we have in you and know that there is something far better than the circumstances we find ourselves in, yet we find ourselves in circumstances, painful ones and difficult ones. And this morning, we lift our brother Larry up to you and just pray that you would give him comfort in his heart and his soul and know that, um, know that he has brothers and sisters who are caring for him and, and loving him. Um, but God, our care and love falls short and yours is perfect. And so we pray that you would be with Larry this morning, that you would, you would comfort his body, that you would give him some, some resolution to his pain. And God, we just ask, God, if it's your will that you would take that pain away, that you would, that you would allow him to not have to struggle any longer, that not because of his own strength or his his own will, but because you're working in his life, that he would be able to, to get up and get back home to Whitey and, and, and the rest of what he wants to do. God, we just pray that, that you would allow him that. Um, but God, in all of this, we know that, that you are a loving God. And even if, if in your providence, it doesn't work out like we think it should, God, we believe that you are good. And we believe that you love us and that you are calling us to something better. Thank you for Jesus and the life that he lived, and we pray that um, we are more like him every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Andrew comes and shares the word, we're gonna be dismissing our kids for their connect groups, and let's stand together as they leave their gifts and let's sing. We declare that the kingdom of God is here. We declare that the kingdom of God is here. Among you, among you, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame men are walking, sickness is fleeing. going to open with a little bit of a funny story, but the scripture is going to be too good, so I'm going to get right into it, okay? Let me pray before we, get, before we open. Oh, Father, we, uh, as we open your word this morning, Father, we know that it is good and it is perfect, and it is your will that is written in this, and it is, it is life for the people who hear it, Father. As you said in Isaiah 55, right, your word gives uh, bread 
to the eater. It gives seed to the sower. It waters the earth, makes it bring forth and sprout, Father. And we know that your word is good. We've experienced this, Father. And I pray that we would experience this this morning. That your word would wash us this morning. And that we would receive the things that, that you've put on my heart to, to, um, to hear. And that they would be your words, Father, not my own. That I would stay faithful to the text, to your word that is perfect and that is truth. Bless this time. Bless all those in the hearing of this word, Father. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we are going to be going through Exodus chapters 19 all the way to 24. Um, we're going to be spending a fair amount of time in chapters 19 and 20, and we're going to pull out just a few things in 21 to 23, and then finish up with a couple final thoughts in chapter 24. Now, chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments, and 21 to 23 are the, uh, the case laws, okay, the, the instructions, the judgments that God gave to the Israelites for the judges to be able to uh, effectively facilitate the Ten Commandments and the laws. Okay, um, but the reason we're only going to pull a few things out of those chapters is because there's a lot of cultural context and historical context that has to be understood to be able to understand the whys and, and the hows of what was being said there. Okay, and so that's just not something we have time for this morning. So, like I said, we're just going to pick out a few things in there. Um, but otherwise, we're going to be going pretty much verse by verse. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 19, right at verse 1, and we're going to we're going to get this going. So verse 1, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So these two verses, just a really quick recap. Up to this time, Israel has taken, uh, it has taken Israel three months to come from the clutches of Egypt come through the Red Sea and have now come to the base of Mount Sinai. Okay, and so if you remember in Exodus chapter 3, this is where uh, God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush and told him to get the Israelites and bring them back to the mountain here to serve him. So Moses has come full circle now back to the mountain with the Israelites. Verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord God called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Okay, this is the first verse that we're going to spend quite a bit of time on. Okay, I want you to see the significance of this being the first thing that God opens with here at Mount Sinai. Okay, Israel's going to be here at Mount Sinai for the next, it's estimated, 12 to 14 months. So they're going to be here for the rest of the book of Exodus, all the way through Leviticus, and they're not going to leave until no, uh, November. Uh, uh, Numbers chapter 10. <laughs> they might be here till November. I don't know what the month was. but So again, this being the first thing that God says, he's reminding them what he's already done before even giving them commandments. Okay? So the, these commandments, yes, they are universal, and God does call them to um, uh, uh, send those, carry those to the rest of the nation, okay? But these, these, um, this being the first thing that God says, right, he's, he's reminding them that I've already invested in you, okay? He's, he calls them to uh, this walk of obedience, calls us to a walk of obedience, but it's not before he's already said, hey, look, look what I've already done for you, okay? He reminds them, remember how I brought you out of slavery. Remember how I protected you th through the plagues, how I protected you from the angel of death during the Passover, how I brought you through on dry ground through the Red Sea, and now have brought you to myself. Okay? So God was telling them, reminding them, showing them everything that he'd already done first. Okay? And that's significant because this also tells us that God's love and faithfulness was never contingent on Israel's ability to be able to keep fulfill the law. 
This was the first thing he said. Before even giving them the Ten Commandments, he says, no, no, before there was a law to transgress, before I established this law with you, before I established this covenant, this relationship, nope, I've already invested in you. I've already loved you. Know that that is, is not um, negotiable. My love here, my faithfulness to you is non-negotiable. It, it, this is set in stone before the law. Okay. So, uh, I, I do want to stress this point. The, the, even when God calls us to task, the, he, he, he does give us his commandments, okay? And he does give us things that he wants us to do in order to be faithful to him and this relationship, this covenant, but it's always in light of what he has already done first, okay? 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. That, don't get that order backwards. That happened first. And by God stating this in the very beginning, before stating the law, he's reminding them, I've already paid for you. I've already redeemed you. I'm not taking you back to the store and, and getting a receipt and my money back. It's not happening. Okay. So this also tells us that our, fl- our faith is not blind. It's not blind. Our faith is based in the reality of what Christ has already done. Okay, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be to me, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Why is that significant? Because all the earth is mine. He's saying, I have created all these people, and above all of them, I could choose anybody of all of them, but I chose you, Israel, to make this relationship with, make this covenant relationship with. Okay, verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has done, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's a little off the cuff, isn't it? Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> it, was, it was glib. They, God hadn't given them the Ten Commandments yet, and they're already saying, yes, yeah, oh, yes, of course, God, yes, let it be so, let it happen. I imagine what Israel heard God saying in, in saying these things, is, hey, you guys remember how I've already brought you out of slavery? You're free, you're welcome. Brought you across the sea, you're here to myself, and now that we're here, we're just going to make this awesome relationship, you're going to be a special people, a special uh, treasure to me, and a holy nation, what does Israel say? Yes, yes, of course, there's no downside, God, t- Moses, tell God to go get some W-4s and get an application, I'll sign on the dotted line, let me go home real quick, I'll grab my, my social security cards and my tax forms, bank statements, yes, make it happen, let's go. No, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I don't mean to spoil the story for you, but they don't. Right? Exodus 32, in just a couple of months, what happens? There's a little bit of partying going on, some dancing. They got a bonfire. Hey, Aaron, why don't you uh, make us up one of those idols so that we can worship our gods? Wink, wink. That actually brought us out of Egypt. Wink, wink. No. No, that didn't happen. They were too quick. They responded in a glib fashion, okay? Verse 9. God, in, 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 in Israel's response here, and as we see in the next coming verses, he did, but in, in my mind, it seems like God starts revealing a little bit of himself to them in response to their, shall we say, insincere answer, okay? Okay? Verse 9, and the Lord says to Moses, said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Okay, he's starting to get a little serious. Verse 10, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon, my, upon, upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Isn't that significant, right? Jesus 
rose on the third day. God is saying, I will reveal myself to the people on the third day. Just a quick side stop. Interesting fact. Verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Now, reading these these last verses by themselves, it would be really easy to say God's going way over the top here. And indeed, he is being extreme. But again, in light of, of Israel's initial response, them being a little, you know, off the cuff, a little too hesitant to, to jump into this, this covenant, plus with the verses that we're about to read here, in my mind, again, it, it seems fairly clear that God wants to make this um, contrast explicitly obvious. This contrast of where he is, his holiness, and where we are, our sinful unrighteousness, okay? Does that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? God's way up here, we're way down here, okay? Sit with that for just a minute. We're gonna sit there for a minute. We're, not, we're, we're gonna come back to this later and we'll resolve it, okay? I promise. Have faith in God's word, it'll be worth it, okay? Verses 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. What an what a awesome scene, right? The smoke, the fire, the earthquake. Wouldn't it be cool if we, could, if we had a time machine and we could go back and, and be with the Israelites there at the base of the mountain and, and experience the awe, you know, be in awe of God's power there, right? Wouldn't it just be so encouraging to your faith? I'd probably never sin again. <laughs> but that's not what happened. Exodus 32, the golden calf, right? And so what is this saying here? Why, why, what is the point of God making this huge distinction between where he is and where we are and, and putting fear in the people? Well, one of those is because God wants to say, look, you see me here, I see you here. But now, th- that's only half the picture. Okay, seeing, seeing the stark contrast is only half the picture. And yes, it is, it is absolutely disparaging to sit with only that half of the picture. Okay, this is where we're gonna resolve it in, ju- in just a minute. Isaiah chapter six, when Isaiah is commissioned, in verse one, Isaiah says he saw God on his throne, high and lifted up. And then verse 3, he says, he sees the seraphim declaring to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then how does he respond in verse 5? He says, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That's us right now. We are a people of unclean lips. Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But in fact, we can stand. We do get to stand, right? 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah says in uh, in, in, in chapter 1 verse 18, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God declared this to them during the exile. Okay? This is because, so so looking at at, at this contrast, we get to see that Christ's work on the cross 
was more significant. It makes it more beautiful, more meaningful. This is the other half of the story that, that, that makes it work, that makes it meaningful. Yes, God is so high, but look at how far, what, how the, 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 the depth and the magnitude of his love to come all the way for us. Isn't it, doesn't it make, isn't it more meaningful when somebody from states away says, hey, I'm gonna make a point to come see you. And you're excited and they, and they come you, hey, you, you've spent all this time traveling, you must be famished. You know, let's, let's, let's sit and have this fellowship together rather than somebody, your next door neighbor, hey, I'm gonna come see you in a couple minutes. Yeah, well, I can see you all the time. No, no, that gap there, noticing that gap is significant because Christ came. So we see those two pictures together and we get a complete, meaningful, loving picture. So, 1 John 4.18 says, There is no love, or excuse me, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So fear does not instill lasting faith. Lasting faith does not come about through fear. And that's what we see here. Remember, God is showing them his awesome power. Exodus 32, golden calf. Didn't happen. Fear was not enough was not good enough to show them, to, to, to put lasting faith in them. A relationship built on love and trust does build lasting faith. And we find that in Christ. Okay? The other thing... Oh, so, so why... Again, let's go back to verse, um, th- those previous verses, 16 to 19. Why was this contrast... Why, why, why be so extreme? The other reason that we can say that, that I believe that this um, transpired in this way is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. He says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So one thing that I can pull from that verse is I can say with absolute certainty that at the very least, right, one reason out of a sea of a billion, trillion reasons, right, one reason at the very least is so that today, here this morning, March 20, excuse me, March 19th, 2023, is that somebody needed to hear, somebody in this room, somebody online, maybe somebody in a week from now who gets to watch the live stream, somebody needed to hear that God's love for them, his faithfulness to them, is not contingent on their performance. That's what is being said here. That is the whole point between, um, behind God saying, I redeemed you first. Okay, that, that is the biggest point I wanted to pull out of chapter 19. So let's finish up here. Um, 19 verse 20. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. No man can stand in the holiness, in the presence of God's holiness. Okay? Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. And then the very ver- first verse of chapter 20, and God spoke all these words saying. Now, an interesting point here, usually when we think of the Ten Commandments, there's you know, a number of, of uh, films that have been done and, and the 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 typical conception is that Moses goes up to the mountain, God does his godly thing and makes an awesome scene, gives him the tablets, and then Moses comes down and then they hear it. Well, that's not actually how it's spelled out here. There's a few verses here, right? At the end of of verse 19, it says, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And then the very first verse, God spoke all these words saying. So God, the, the first hearing of the 10 commandments by Israel was God's own voice. And I just thought that was an awesome point, so we'll keep moving. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God 
Uh, Chapter 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Same thing here. Exactly the same point. Before making the law, before, before giving them the Ten Commandments, God is doing the same exact thing. Now, there's one more point that I want to bring out of here, especially with the Ten Commandments. So when we read especially in this day, when we hear words like laws, commandments, rules, judgments, we have this, there's the stigma attached to words like that. And we go, ooh, 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 that's something that I have to do against my will and somebody's oppressing me. Okay, well, the first thing I would say to that is remember what Satan said to Eve. God doesn't want, to eat, want you to eat that fruit because you'll be awesome if you are. He's oppressing you. Don't take that. okay. The second thing I'm going to say about that is the law, the covenant, the commandments, all of this was given from a heart of love. It is absolutely imperative that we see that and understand that before going in because when we read these things, again, our, our typical, our human nature is we want to, we want to see where somebody's cheating us or, or getting a hand up on us and it's, and it's not fair. But that's not what was going on here. God was explaining to them the nature of things, and the nature of things is God. So he, when he gave these, it wasn't to put them back into bondage. It was to, to show his character, and his character is a heart of love. So again, with him reminding them that he brought them out of Egypt, I am the Lord your God, saying your God, he's also saying I will be faithful to you before establishing this covenant he says that okay what this also says is he has their best interests in heart so really quickly again when we read stuff like this it's important that we take our lenses off and we put the lenses of God's heart on okay because when we read these and when we when we when we sit and we know that God loves and is love it makes the reading of these well, it goes a little bit quicker, but it's, it's also easier. We, we don't have to sit there and wrestle with, well, why does this make sense? Why, how is this love? When we sit there and we have to rationalize in our own minds, no, let's, let's, let's get the baseline set before we go through these, okay? Isaiah 43, verses one to four says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overthrow you, overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, not, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Here it is. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Tell me where where you heard oppression in there. No, he says, I want to establish this relationship with you because I love you. Look what I already did. I've shown you that I love you. Now, now, I'm calling into obedience, okay? Why do people get married? It's usually because they love one another, right? Typically, that might be challenged this day, but people get married because they love one another. And when the the wedding ceremony is going on, they exchange vows, right? And it's not usually, oh, I'm glad I have to do these things, and this is just going to be the worst life ever. That doesn't happen. When, when it's, the wedding ceremony is a joyous occasion. Everybody is smiling and, 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 well, you know, the people that are happy for them are smiling. <laughs> Maybe some of the in-laws might not be, but <laughs> generally speaking, it is a happy occasion, right? And so when they, when they speak these vows to one another, it's, it's, it's not, I have to do these things. That's not going through their mind. It's, I choose to commit myself, to commit to you in this way because I love you and I care for you and I want to honor the relationship, this covenant, this commitment that's between us. And so in that way, we can look at the laws and the commandments in a framework of a relationship in that way. And that's what it was because God was saying, I love you. 
feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but this is, this is foundational to our faith, guys. We have to see, the, at, the, at the very least, these chapters, but the rest of the Bible was written for love. God loves his creation. He didn't create us just so he'd have somebody to stick his thumb on. It's not how, it, it's not how, to, it's not how the Bible should be read. Okay, sort of got off track, so let me grab my notes here. Okay, no, I was right on track. Okay, so let's, let's get into the Ten Commandments here. Verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, we know that God's not sticking his thumb on them. God declaring this as the first commandment, he's saying this relationship is exclusive. This extru- it's not you, me, and your financial ability. It's not you, me, and your political power. Nope, it's you and me, and that's it. Case is closed. You and me. Okay, number two, verse four. You shall make for yourself, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Really quickly, the second commandment is a, a reiteration of the first commandment. Okay? This is God, uh, again, re- reinforcing. It's, it's, this is you and me. This is a covenant between you and me. Though, there, are, there were uh, exceptions made even, even before this. right? I think it's uh, Exodus chapter 12 around verse 38, where it says, uh, when the Egypt, Egyptians, the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, they came out in a mixed company. And we could go through a whole lesson on, on, on that phrase alone, but the, the, the general point to be made there is it wasn't just the Israelites that came out of Egypt. Israelites and Egyptians came out. So God was already extending grace again before the law even happened. And, and I want to make a point out of these, out of verse five and six here, where it says, of visiting iniquity on the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. God is also saying here that he is not obligated to be faithful to those that are outside this covenant. This is the covenant that we have established. I and you, and I am faithful to you. I'm not going to be faithful to somebody that's outside. Again, look at this as a marriage relationship. You, You are faithful to that person. Does it make sense that you're going to be holding the same accountability of yourself and the other to somebody who's not. It's not the way it was designed. It's not the way it's going to happen, okay? But again, as, we, as I talked about in, in Exodus chapter 12, right? Verse six says, who love me and who keep my commandments. So in the loving God, we, can, we, we show that we love him and honor this relationship, this covenant, by following his commandments. Again, this following these commandments is, is not, I have to do this. It's, I want to do this because I know you already love me and is honoring by doing that, okay? Verse seven, the next commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the, law, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And so I think most often we think that this just means cursing. Well, it's, it's not only that. It's, it also encompasses idle or irreverent talk. And so in a, uh, in a marriage, that could look, could look like something like, you know, talking about, uh, talking down uh, about your spouse or diminishing the relationship in any way that, that damages the image of, of your spouse and or the relationship. Now, there, all, there are always occasions where you should seek help because there's a problem there, but that's, again, that's not what's being talked about here, okay? Irreverent and idle talk is also talked about in here. Uh, Number four, verses eight to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. God's extending grace to those outside. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So I'm not going to beat this one very much. We, we just went through uh, a study on the Sabbath, and so we can say confidently that, these, that, that the reason he's making this as a commandment is we honoring the Sabbath is a way that we posture ourselves in order to receive and say we are dependent on God's provision. Okay? The next one, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. This one is under major attack these days, right? And, and again, I, I, I know there's, there's always extenuating circumstances where, where the, the, the parents have not been good at all to the kids. And so I would say when it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to follow this command, I would say the very least that we can do is pray for those parents. God loves them. And I, and I could say the people that have experienced this I imagine, I've never been in this situation, but I imagine they would say that at the very least, they wish it was different. They wish the, the parent was better. And so in that, there is a little bit of love and grace that can be extended. And so wishing they could be better also looks like praying for them. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Okay, I wanna stop on this one just really quick. This doesn't mean any killing. The, the Hebrew language here is, is unjust taking of life. We could go for days on that one, especially these days. But also, negligent taking of life. Okay, And, and here's our first reference to uh, uh, chapter 21, verses 28 and 29. It says, If an ox gores a man or woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. He didn't know. It wasn't his fault. He's fine. Just take the ox. Uh, but verse 29, But if the ox tended to thrust with its horn in times past, and its owner has been, has been made known to its owner, excuse me, and it has been made known to its owner, and he has not kept it confined, so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. So God is, whole, negligence, ignorance is not an excuse here. God is saying, nope, you knew it happened and you let it happen again. Uh-huh. So he's holding people accountable for negligence. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Another one that we could spend a lot of time on. Verse 15, you shall not steal. This one, we're going to go right next to, uh, um, excuse me. Yeah, so Exodus 22, verse 5 says, If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal, and it feeds in another man's field, you shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. Again, kind of speaking of negligence right there, isn't it? So if you're, uh, you are responsible for your ox or your animals, and if it feeds on others, um, vineyards and, and fields, that is still considered theft, and he is holding them responsible. Okay, number nine, verse uh, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And this one, it, it's interesting how, how God talks about this one. We'll, we'll go to Exodus 23, verses seven and eight. Keep yourself far from fal a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe for, or you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. So it's interesting that that in these two verses, God is connecting false witness, dealing in false matters, with the killing of the innocent. Okay. The last one. Verse 17, do not covet. And just briefly on this one, when we, when we, excuse me, let me read the verse. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So when we covet, there's two things that happen. One, either we feel like we've been cheated somehow, and or we believe 
that somehow God has not provided us with everything that we need. And so when we follow this coveting to its logical end, we not only sin against our neighbor, we sin against God. Okay. The last point that I want to make before ending the Ten Commandments here, to kind of close these out before we move on a little bit, is uh, there was a uh, last term uh, at seminary, we took a class that was a survey of the Old Testament. And in that survey, there was a number of themes that were, uh, that maintained continuity through the whole Old Testament. And one of those was Israel's chief sin. I'll tell you this, it wasn't their, uh, their failure to keep the law. It was unbelief. Their unbelief led to their transgression of the law. What do I mean? When we don't believe that, that these things, that God is love, and that he, he said these things and, and set up these things from a heart of love, oh yeah, of course we're, we're going to do all the things that we want because we don't think it's loving, we think it's oppressive. Their chief sin was they didn't believe that God was the perfect and absolute epitome of of goodness, the perfect and absolute epitome of, of love and beauty. And that, that's us today. That's the hardest thing that we have to, to struggle with. I, that is the hardest thing I struggle with, is believing that God is absolutely good, absolute love, absolute beauty. Going through these, if we can hold on to that, gosh, it makes it, it makes a lot of things make a whole lot more sense and it's easier to read them. Again, the, the, our lens is taken off and we see things through God's heart because when we, when we, again, when we put on our own lenses, we have a problem as humans and we put our own pain, our own faults, our own agony and trauma where other people's intentions are and that's not okay. God's intentions were not pain. And this is why Paul in Ephesians verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 12 said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling spiritually and mentally against the influential forces of unbelief. Forces that say there is no such thing as perfect goodness or beauty and love because it's all relative. What's good for you might not be good for me. Well, believe whatever you want. That doesn't change the reality of what Christ has already <coughs> done as we saw okay let's finish up this chapter here verse uh, 18 now all the people witnessed the thunderings the lightning flashes the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they trembled and stood afar off then they said to Moses you speak with us and we will hear but let not God speak with us lest we die and Moses said to the people do not fear for God has come to test you that his fear or the reverence of him, may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And that's an interesting thought there, isn't it? The, the Israelites withdrew for fear of death. No, no, don't, God, no more, more speaking, stop. We'll talk to you, Moses. God is terrifying. They withdrew for fear of death. But again, what, what was it that Moses did? Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So the people withdrew out of fear. Moses drew near to God without the fear of death. Why? Because perfect love casts out fear. And Moses knew that. Okay. Let's get into chapter 24 here. So we, we already went through as many points as I'm going to pull out of 21 and 22 and 23. So we're going to finish up with a few final thoughts in chapter 24. Verses, uh, starting in verse 1. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, excuse me, and the judgments, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. So up to this point, we've, 
We've seen the, the Israelites have been made aware of the law, the covenant, the relationship, all the things that God requires of them, largely speaking. And so, okay, the, the, God is saying, these, these, this is my terms, now respond appropriately. And so, okay, that's what Israel says. All the, Lord's, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Verse four, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, the Judges, the judgments. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. Half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then the Lord, excuse me, then he took the book of the covenant, that's all the judgments, the, the, the law and the commandments, and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Verse eight, and Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Then Moses went up also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the, ver excuse me, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Isn't that awesome? To be able to behold God, sit there in his presence. And the reason um, that he sprinkled the blood on them and, 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 and um, talked about the blood of the covenant here, right? So in, during the Passover in Egypt, blood was shed uh, and put over the doorpost in order to, for the, the Israelites to be saved from the angel of death at that point. Here, he puts it on the altar at Mount Sinai and over the people. So the blood here was shed so that for Israel to be dedicated in this covenant, binding them together, the Lord in this covenant and Israel in this covenant, okay? And then this covenant is now fulfilled, brought to completion at the cross through Christ. Hebrews 9, uh, verse 11 to 15 says, but Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer uh, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the, the, the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator, just as Moses was. He was the, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. He's talking about this right here, okay? That those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So the covenant was fulfilled by the blood of Christ where it couldn't be fulfilled by the blood of goats and, and, and calves at Mount Sinai. Okay, let's, let's finish up chapter 24 here in verse nine. Then Moses, oh, excuse me, we already read that part. Okay, so by Israel being able to stand here and, and, and have this meal with God, two things are happening. God is declaring peace with Israel and he's also saying that as of this point right now, Israel is a holy nation before God. So that's their restoration here. Is they, they are the holy nation that he was talking about. They are. It is established. The blood that was sprinkled on everybody, done deal. Okay. That's all I've got for you this morning. I know we went a little bit long. There were some things in there that I just, I had to get out. A lot of it was a little dry. I, I apologize for that part. But um, being that we went a little bit long, if you took notes, cool. If you didn't, the live stream will be posted on, on YouTube. Or <laughs> you can... Come find me after, after the service, and if you've got any questions, I'll be happy, more than happy to, to uh, talk through those with you. Okay, we'll stand and sing.
Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty. Exodus 32 through 34 next week. 
So you can preview that and uh, look at that portion of scripture. Let's declare together the church proclaims. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Have a blessed week.